death for every man. This is exactly not only what happened according to scripture, but this is what we commemorate, Christendom commemorates, especially at this time of the year. So, and I trust you have been blessed, encouraged, or as we continue to remind ourselves of what took place 2,000 years ago when God sent his son to die on the cross in our stead. A message that has been, been preached for over 2,000 years, but sadly the rest of the unsaved world uh, are allowing to let the message fall in deaf ears. So um, nonetheless, we are commanded to preach this message until the Lord Jesus Christ comes. So um, we continue in our series and we come to the seventh of the seven last words of Christ. It's so impossible, it's just impossible to exhaust the spiritual treasures that can be drawn from these sacred passages. But I trust that as we've seen through the surface, that we've had a glimpse of what was taking place at the heart of God as he sent his son to die on the cross, especially through these seven sayings of Christ. So we're turning our Bibles now to Luke chapter 23. We shall be reading verses 4 to 4, all to verse 49. Luke chapter 23, 44 to 49. And as we read this portion of Scripture responsibly, I shall request the one to please rise up as we read this responsibly. We have got honor and due reverence. Luke 23, 44 to 49. Together the 49th verse, verse 44, and it was told, it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. So the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst. <clears throat> and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now when the centurion saw the Lord's son, he glorified God, saying, Certainly this was a righteous man. And all the people that came together to that sight, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. Verse 49. And all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from Galilee, so far off, beholding these things. Our Father in heaven, again, we come before you. Thank you for giving us the word incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ, so that he could taste death for unworthy sinners like us. Thank you for imputing our sins on him, the sinless one, so that we need not taste death ourselves. And I pray as we continue to proclaim this message, help us, Lord, uh, to be faithful in this God-given task, not only to do it, but to finish it and leaving the results to you. For we realize, as Paul said, we can plant, we can water. It is you who ultimately will give the increase. We pray uh, also and are thankful for the word inspired, given to us by men who were moved by no less than the third person of the Trinity, so that we have an accurate record, preserved record of what took place, that we can turn to, we can verify, the uh, historical accounts and its explanation to the epistles so that uh, we can continue to maintain an accurate message and deliver it accurately as well to generations coming and even to this day. And Lord, we pray with, uh, that your Holy Spirit will freely work using your sharp to insert to speak and to minister, to illumine to encourage, to comfort, to console, perhaps to convict or to rebuke, whatever the need might be. Thank you that you have promised to accomplish the purposes of your word every time it, is, it, will, be, it will be proclaimed or it will go forth. And we commit the rest of our study into your hands. Give us hearts receptive to thy truth that we will receive it with meekness. The engrafted word which is able to sanctify or deliver our souls. So we shall thank you for it with us we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> well, I am thankful that none of you brought any of those mga palaspas ni umaga. Because I will not bless them. I don't have that authority anyway. And that's a tradition that we know we normally do before we 
came to know Jesus Christ the Savior. <clears throat> it is blessed enough to hear the preaching and teaching of the Word of God and to be reminded of what the Holy Spirit left us in the sacred pages of Scripture so that we know exactly what happened. And we can see its practical ramifications into our everyday life. It is interesting that the, see the, the, the passages that we've been looking at for the last seven Sundays, remember, a reminder to us that these are actually historical narratives recorded by men who were moved by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we have an accurate record of what actually took place. These are not just stories with a lesson. These are not just myths with a practical lesson. These are actual historical narratives that took place in time, space, existence. Therefore, we are looking at history looking back to what happened. Just as the Old Testament saints, all Old Testament people were looking back at, the, at what happened at the Garden of Eden, the fall of man, and look forward to the coming of Christ, the first coming at the cross, and then they were saved. We also are saved by looking back to history and also look forward to the second coming of Christ. So we are coming to the seventh, all the seven sayings of Christ and while Jesus Christ hung upon the cross we've already pointed out seven times his lips moved in speech number seven according to scripture is a number of completion six days the Lord created the world on the seventh day God rested completed his work of creation in these seven sayings we find the work of Christ being completed as well the work of the new creation, the perfection of the blameless one is clearly displayed on Calvary by him of whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwelleth in him bodily. This is Jesus Christ, nothing to be compared to. We cannot compare him to anyone because he is unique. He is the only God-man of all of human history. God made heaven and earth in six days and the seventh day he rested contemplating with satisfaction that which he pronounced very good after the sixth day. Here, his sixth utterance was, it is finished. The seventh brings him to a place or to the place of rest that is in the Father's hands. In each of our Savior's utterance, a biblical prophecy was actually and literally fulfilled. So we find in these seven last words, first of all, a word of uh, forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He made intercession for transgressors. Here's the love of God being displayed at Calvary. And we know from scripture that God's love is a love that forgives. The second of the seven sayings, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. It was a word of salvation. In other words, remember Jesus, or rather the prophets predicted as Matthew records, that when Jesus was coming, he shall, you shall call his name Jesus, and the name Jesus means he shall save his people from their sins. <coughs> and that's exactly what happened at the cross. The thief beside Christ, perhaps who lived a life of depravity and dysfunctionality, committed a crime that was worthy of the death penalty, was hanging beside the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet at his last final breath, at his deathbed, he found conversion to Christ. He placed his trust in Christ the Savior, and right there and then Jesus promised, today you shall be with me in paradise. You can do, I cannot even imagine how, the, how peace flooded the soul of this dying man when he was assured of Christ, of his eternal security. It's a love that transforms from a life of the uttermost all the way to the uttermost. It's the same today. Regardless of your totally sinful background, Christ can transform your life to usability if you would only come to him. The third of the seven sayings, Woman, behold thy son. 
It, uh, the, the Bible predicted in Luke chapter 2 verse 35, A sword shall pierce through thine own soul also. Speaking of Mary. And we find here God's love displayed because it is a love that provides. The fourth, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A fulfillment of Psalms chapter 2, 22 rather, verse 1. In other words, those words show to us God's love is a love that endures. Then we go to the fifth saying, Jesus cried out, I thirst. So uh, Psalm 69, 21 tells us and predicts, in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink, as the Old Testament writer says. But we find there in that saying, a love that suffers, being displayed by Christ. Last week we saw <coughs> Christ crying out on Calvary, it is finished. Uh, the Bible says in Psalms 22, verse 31, in fulfillment of Scripture, He hath done or finished the work of atonement. Christ was displaying a love that triumphs, that is victorious. Now we come to the seventh. We read it in Luke chapter 23. It said, Jesus said, Father, into thy hands I commend or commit my spirit. Exactly as the psalmist puts it in chapter 31, verse 5. Evil fulfillment of scripture. God's love is a love that surrenders. Surrenders to the Father's will. All was said and done in each of these seven sayings according to what stood written according to the scriptures. So, as we come to this seven, let me lay down for you our outline and flesh it out, flesh it out one at a time. Number one, we have in this seventh saying the sa displayed the Savior's communion with the Father restored. His fellowship with the Father restored at this point. Second, we see a contrast between God's hands and sinners' hands, men's hands. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. This is God's hands to Christ was committing his life to in contrast to man's hands. Point number three, <coughs> excuse me, we find Christ's perfect yieldedness and absolute trust in God, despite what the Father was doing to his Son. He allowed his Son and gave up his Son at the cross, yet Christ nonetheless trusted him absolutely. Number four, we find the uniqueness of the Savior. <clears throat> no one else could do this and ever did this. There, because Christ is certainly unique and nobody else will do this ever for us. <clears throat> Finally, we find the place of our eternal haven and our security. Just as where the Son found security, eternal security, it is the same place where every sinner will find the same even today. So let's get to each one, to each of this point one at a time. First of all, let us take note <clears throat> the Savior's communion with the Father restored. We know for a fact that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, yet three distinct persons, the same in essence, distinct in existence, the same in substance, but distinct in subsistence, eternally enjoyed eternal fellowship one with the other. Even before the world began, sins eternity past, that is hard for us to fathom, those of us, all of us who are living in limited time space existence. But this is what the Savior enjoyed with the Heavenly Father. But even as we kind of went through the seven sayings of Christ for a moment there, for a while, that communion that was, was outwardly broken because our sins was imputed on the sinless one. The light of God's holy countenance was hid from the sin bearer. Jesus Christ, as he was paying our debt in this eternal transaction, once and for all, sacrificing and shedding his blood for our sins. At that momentous event, God the Father forsook his son. 
Can you imagine that? When you and I go through trouble, we are commanding the scripture to pass our cares upon him. But Jesus Christ was forsaken of the heavenly father at this precise moment. That's why one of the things is said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Up to the cross, there had been perfect, unbroken communion between the Father and the Son. And between these seven utterances, as we read in Scripture, Jesus hung for six hours. Three hours spent suffering at the hands of men. And three hours spent suffering in the hands of God. I'd like to turn to Isaiah chapter 53 for a moment. Isaiah chapter 53 and in verse 10. What an amazing passage we find in this portion of scripture. Well, what are we referring to here? Let me read this portion to you. Isaiah 53, as many Bible expositors will say, is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. John 3.16 is the heart of the New Testament. Isaiah 53 is the John 3.16 of the Old Testament, prophesying the time when Jesus Christ would bear our sins in his own body on the tree. We find it in verses 5 and verse 6. But take note specifically, verse 10. The Bible says, Yet it pleased the Lord. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. And he had put him to grief. And thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Let that wrap in your mind, in your limited minds. It pleased the Lord to bruise his son. <coughs> exactly as the prophet predicted. Well, how could God, in all of his perfection, please to bruise his sinless son? He was carrying out the eternal counsels of God so that Jesus Christ, the sinless one, could atone for your sins and mine. The darkness is past. The Savior is seen once again in communion with the Heavenly Father, and this time never to be broken. Thankfully, the Father was pleased to lose his sinless son. And he did it for you and for me. Thankfully, Jesus Christ did not hesitate. Rather, he voluntarily gave up his life in our stead. Because the Bible says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. What an amazing truth this is. Finally, we find the communion of the Father and the Son restored. So he cries to the Father, Father. In that word, Father, the address to God, the Father, is an encouraging and an assuring title. He was in constant and close communion with the Heavenly Father all throughout his entire life. Not only in eternity, but during his earthly life and ministry. But now, even in death. He cries out to God as Father. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, he said, Wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? That was when he was arguing with those doctors in the temple. Jesus spoke of his father 17 times at the Sermon on the Mount. In his final Paschal discourse in John 14 through chapter 16, 45 times did he refer to God as his Father. In his prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, his high priestly prayer, we find Jesus Christ six times mentioning God as his Father. Now, as he lays down his life again, he calls him with his loving title, Father. Talks about that special bond that Jesus Christ had with God himself. Oh, the blessing is that as believers in Jesus Christ, you and I have the same privilege to enjoy such communion with the Father at all times. The Bible says, but as many as receive God, receive Christ, 
receive him to them who receive him. God gives him the power, the authority, the privilege to become children of God. What a blessing that we can call God as our Father. In contrast to all other pagan religions, they perceive and view God as the supreme being. He is so tyrannical, angry with the wicked, angry with sinners, so that there is no way that sinners can pay, can, uh, can be reconciled to God except for their own payment. And according to the Word of God, according to biblical Christianity, we have no capacity to do that. And yet man-made religion tells us keep on working and working and working and there is no assurance that you can ever atone for your sin. What a cruel God is that? But thank God that's not the God of the Bible. We have that privilege to come to God through Christ and the moment we trust Him just like Jesus Christ we can call Him as our Father. It is our privilege to enjoy communion with Him at all times. First John 3, 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Listen. The Bible does not teach all men are children of God. All men are creatures but not children of God. And only those who put their trust in Christ are privileged to call him as our father. <clears throat> Just as Daniel in the lion's den, Paul and Silas in jail, you and I as believers can enjoy communion or fellowship with God. What a gracious privilege that is. Second, let us take note the contrast between God's hands and men's hands. Father, he says, into thy hands. More than 12 hours Jesus Christ had been in the hands of men. Turn me to Matthew chapter 17, verses 22 and 23. Matthew 17, verses 22 to 23. And how did Jesus Christ fare with the hands of sinners, with the hands of men? Matthew 7, 22 and 23. And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, the Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men. They shall kill him. And the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. Matthew 26, 45. Again, the inspired writer tells us how Jesus Christ fared in the hands of sinful men. Matthew 26, 45. We read, Then cometh he to his disciples, and saith unto him, unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, that the Son of Man, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. And now in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, particularly in chapter 24, verses 6 and 7, on the day of the resurrection, the angels told him, He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered, where? Into the hands of sinful men, and be crucified, and the third day rise again. The hands of sinners. When the Bible speaks of Christ being placed in the hands of sinners, the full vent of human depravity is always displayed. And is it not the, no different today? You talk to the unsaved about the gospel. About God showing his love toward us even though we were sinners, Christ died for us. And yet sinners naturally show their vent and their hatred towards the things of God. And this is what happens when sinners have the gems of the gospel into their hands. They show natural hostility to the things of God. You see, how do you explain that, Pastor? Well, the Bible explains it very clearly. John chapter 3. Why do sinners reject the gospel, reject the light of Jesus Christ, despite of the fact that they know that this will benefit them? John chapter 3 tells us the reason. Men love darkness rather than light. Why so? 
because their deeds are evil. Unsaved men love darkness rather than light because they want to hide in the darkness of their sin. The light will expose their guilt. This is what happens when sinners get advantage of the things of God. The appointed time has finally come when he, Jesus Christ, should submit himself and to be led as a lamb to the slaughter. Men looking forward to this opportunity eventually gave full vent to the hatred of their carnal heart for God. Voluntarily, nonetheless, Jesus Christ delivered himself into the hands of sinners. He did not reluctantly do this. He voluntarily did this. And likewise did he, Jesus Christ, deliver his spirit into the hands of the Father. Never again to be at the mercy of the wicked. What a wonderful truth. Finally it has come to this point. So three days after this incident, the father raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Forty days later, the father exalted him above all principalities and powers of the day of the ascension and set him at the right, his own right hand in the heavenly places. And someday, the father will send him back this earth to judge all wicked sinners, all who have rejected God's son. Once, he was in their hands. At the second coming, they shall be in his hands. It's going to be payday someday. Once they said, I with him. Yeah, On that day, Jesus will say, depart from me. I never knew you. What a great truth is it. You and I as believers in Christ, when we try to witness for the gospel to unsaved people, do not be surprised if the world will hate you. That's what Jesus said. If the world hated me, they will hate you also. John 16, Jesus says there's coming a time when people will think that they're doing service to God while they hate you. This is the, this is the natural bent of sinful humanity. Their hostility towards the things of God. And even when you get into some churches, religious circles, there are people who continue to be repulsive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because they would rather rest in their own self-righteousnesses rather than the perfect righteousness of the sinless Son of God. But it's going to come. Can you imagine when that day happens? When Jesus will tell ungodly sinners, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, into everlasting fire. <clears throat> they will be eternally separated from the God of love. To face God in eternal fire and know experientially the wrath of God. And I'm praying that none, well, none of us who are listening to this message, who are here in this auditorium, would come to that point. If you have not placed your trust in Christ as your Savior, if you still think your good works, your rituals, your relics, your rosary beads, your religion, your own righteousnesses can save you, you are mistaken. You have been deceived by the enemy. None of these combined can deliver the soul from sin and hell. For if could, if it could, then Jesus Christ would not have died on the cross for our sins. Thankfully, at this point, God the Father was ready, was about to accept the sacrifice of His Son. So Christ cries out to the heavenly Father, Father, into Thy hands I commend my spirit. We also take note in these words, Christ's perfect yieldedness and absolute trust in God. As Jesus Christ had lived, even so he died, yielding himself into the hands of the Father. That word I commend is the word, the Greek word, which means to deposit. It's actually a banking term. It's 
when you deposit your money in the bank, it's a trust. You entrust your resources into a bank for protection. Hopefully it will yield some interest. It means to entrust. Jesus says, saying, Father, into thy hands I entrust, I commend it. The Greek word is paratithemi. Para means alongside and tithemi means to put. Therefore, it's a compound word which means to put together, to put alongside or to place alongside. It's the same root word but different form in 2 Timothy 1.12. What does 2 Timothy 1, 12 say? The Apostle Paul. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have what? Committed unto him against that day. What a marvelous exhibition of Jesus' absolute dependency upon God. Doing the Father's will implies absolute trust in him. Even at a time when Christ had to suffer momentary separation from the Heavenly Father. His faith and confidence in the Heavenly Father never wavered, wavered one bit. How many of us start doubting or questioning God when we go through moments of trials? Do you know that the time, the, 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 the best time we show Strength, or rather, the best time we show confidence or faith in God is in the moment of trials. How many times in Scripture that the most powerful statements of faith were stated in a moment of trial? The book of Job tells us that. Job was reading in pain from the crown of his head to the sole of his feet. His, his wife even said, curse God! But what did Job say? In the midst of that sobering trial, he said, The Lord gave, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord. What a powerful statement of faith. God never forsook him. Habakkuk chapter 3, specifically, Habakkuk already saw the coming of the Babylonians. He anticipated how the plants will be ravished, why the women would be raped, and the country will be subdued by the wicked Babylonians. But Habakkuk said, yet, in spite of all this, yet will I trust in him. Are you going through some trial? Whatever you're going through, this is the moment where you can show complete confidence in the God of the Bible. I was asked yesterday if you were able to see the Anchor of Hope uh, broadcast. And you know, one of the anchors there was saying, you know, when sometimes when people, especially in the third, in in first developed countries, enjoy plenty, that they often forget God. So I made the comment that's usually the case. Human nature tells us that where when God blesses us with plenty, we have the tendency to get so engrossed with the blessings that we forget the blesser. That's just true. So there is danger with our hearts when we are in the midst of plenty. We need to guard our hearts against unbelief. But it's equally true, it works the other way around as well. There are people who don't have much who are going through some trial, and yet instead of trusting in God, they become bitter against God. I wonder if I am describing any one of our hearts. Are we going through tough times? And we are tempted to listen to the voice of the devil say, why should you trust God still when you, he is allowing you to go through these tough trials? This is the moment you need to show your trust in him, your dependence in him, in the midst of the crucible of suffering. And Jesus Christ displayed it on Calvary. He showed yieldness, perfect yieldness, and absolute trust in his heavenly Father. And so should we do the same. Point number four, notice though, the uniqueness of the Savior. No one has ever done this. His life was taken from him, or rather his life was not taken from him. He laid it down himself. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Commend me is an active voice. 
meaning to say the verb, the doer of the verb is the subject. Jesus here is the I. I commend my spirit. It is Jesus actively doing this. His own spirit to the Heavenly Father. The Holy Spirit here is describing the actual laying down of Jesus' life. Use three different expressions to bring this out forcibly. In Matthew 27, verse 50, the Bible tells a record Matthew uses the term which means to yield it up. He yielded up the ghost, meaning to let go, to dismiss, denoting the authority as a king. That's the theme of Matthew. This is the Savior, but he is the king, predicted by the Old Testament prophets. And here is the king yielding up the ghost. In the Gospel of Luke, Mark chapter, rather in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, 37, and Luke 23, 46, the Greek word is ekneo, which means translated to give up. It means to expire. Jesus Christ chose to give up, expire his life as a perfect suffering servant. In John chapter 19, verse 13, the word is paradidomi, which means to deliver up. Translated, he gave up as one who has full power over it. Remember the theme of the Gospel of John is Jesus Christ is God. So here is God the Son who with all full authority gave up his life to the Heavenly Father. So make it very clear to us, Jesus Christ was no martyr. He was not a victim of circumstances. He voluntarily gave up his life. John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Here's what the text of scripture says, quoting the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore doth my father love me because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. And this commandment have I received of my Father. How can it be plainer than that? Two things necessary for the propitiation of our sins. Number one is the complete satisfaction of God's outraged holiness and offended justice. God's justice, outraged holiness, has to be adequately satisfied by a substitutionary sacrifice. The second thing is that the Savior should taste death. That sacrifice had to die because the wages of sin is death. And both these two things was completely and adequately satisfied by the sacrifice of his sinless son. So now, unconquered by death, the perfect master cries with a loud voice and delivers up his spirit into the hands of his father. That is, by an act of his own volition, of his own will. To a mere man, it would have been suicide. If you and I did it, I commend my spirit. Then that's committing suicide. But to Christ, it is proof of his perfection and of his uniqueness, of his deity. Jesus is God. And no one else can adequately atone for our sins. Usually at this time of the year, especially in this country, we have people, we call them flagellantes, who literally nail themselves to the cross with their <coughs> backs bloody sore. And there is no doubt we do not question the sincerity of these people. But sadly, they are sincerely wrong. They fail to realize that no amount of human sacrifice, even to the point of shedding our own blood, can adequately satisfy the outraged justice and holiness of God. Nothing. There is only one who can adequately satisfy that, and it's the sacrifice of his sinless son. You want to look for a savior that will save you from your sin? He has to be, number one, able to save. Number two, willing to save. If you were drowning in the middle of a pool or in the beach, so what do you need? You need a lifeguard. 
two qualifications for a lifeguard to save you. He should be able. It is not enough to be willing. I might be seeing you drowning out there and I, hold it, I'm her pastor. I'm his, I want to save him. I'm a, but if I don't know how to swim, I'm not, I may be willing, I'm not able. I'll be drowning with you. So I may be willing, but I'm not able. But I may be able. I can. I may. I may be able to swim well. But if I'm not willing, you won't be saved. Jesus Christ was willing. He was able. And he alone is willing. He alone is able. Both qualifications met by Jesus Christ. And therefore, he alone can save us from our sins. So stop trusting in any other. In the words of Peter, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name given, over, given under, under men before men, before whereby we must be saved. No other name given under earth before men by which we must be saved. There is none other. <clears throat> Finally, notice the place of our eternal haven in our security. At the cross, Christ hung as our representative, as the representative of his people. Therefore, we view his last act as a representative one. Just like when Adam sinned, he brought the entire human race into sin. His sin was representative of all of us. That's why his sin was imputed to us. We all inherited Adam's sin because Adam was our federal head a representative. Now some people say, well, that's unfair. Why should Adam's sin be imputed on me? I did not commit that sin. Have you ever heard that thinking? That line of thinking? Well, let me put it this way. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he also acted as a representative. No complaints. We say, well, that's unfair. Well, it's going to be benefiting me anyway. The first Adam failed, we all were born in trespasses and sin. The second Adam, the last Adam, as a representative one, was an act by the representative, our representative. So when he commended his spirit into the Father's hands, he also presented our spirits along with his. John chapter 10, verse 29. Let me close with two, four, two, a few more verses here. Jesus is my Father who gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them, referring to his sheep, out of my Father's hands. Nothing, nothing. In fact, if you read those verses from verse 28, I give unto them, to my sheep, eternal life they shall never, neither shall any, did you notice that word man in that text? Neither shall any man, the word man is in italics, which means it is not in the original. <clears throat> Notice that word them is also not in the original, it's in italics. In other words, if you remove that word, notice how it will sound. In verse 28, neither shall any <clears throat> block them out of my hand. Whether they be man or angel, no one any, neither can any pluck them out of my hand, Jesus says. My Father who gave them me is greater than all, and no is able, is able. No one is able to pluck out of my Father's hand. So notice the impact of those words. It does, it's not just referring to what man can do. No creature can pluck anyone out of the Father's hand. When he present, when he died on the cross and commit his spirit, he also presented our spirits as well. So we in ourselves, the Bible tells us we as believers are First Peter one five. We are kept by the power of God. Can you think of any other power greater? There is no power greater. 1 Peter 1 5. Every born again child of God is kept by no less than the power of God. Reserved unto salvation in due time. 
Therefore, as believers, we should find great comfort in this. So let me leave this challenge to you. Here are the seven sayings Jesus Christ adequately atoned for our sins. We've seen what was in the heart of Christ, of the Son of God, when, when he gave up his life in our stead. But we are sin better and sin sons as you. Have you trusted in Christ as your Savior? Do you know for sure if you die today you're going to heaven? If you're not sure, we're willing to show you from a Bible, an open Bible, how to be saved. So that you can find the assurance through, through the finished work of Jesus Christ. For those of us already done so, Christ gave his all. And he already has saved us, those who trusted in Christ from our sins. What's holding us back to give our all to him? We have no logical, sensible explanation to justify our half-heartedness towards our Savior. He deserved nothing but our absolute 100% devotion. Are we living in accordance to His perfect will? Our Father in Heaven, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for what we have accomplished at the cross. And we cannot be thankful enough. We owe everything to You. We are yours by creation. We are yours by the new creation. And therefore, help us, Lord, to take our lives and let it be consecrated, Lord. Hands bowed, eyes closed, with no one looking around. I'm going to give a brief invitation. We'll follow into the communion. See, Pastor, pray for me. I am a Christian. I have trusted.